Um, the thing that all these amendments in this grouping hold in common is the belief that conscientious objection should only be provided in relation to hands-on activity of actually pre performing the abortion. Uh, they suggest that other facilitating activities upon which the performance of the abortion depends should not be included within the scope of the conscientious objection. My Lord, my Lord, if we are serious about conscientious objection, this simply doesn't make sense. If we recognize that different people have different views about the morality of abortion, and that uh, while some of us regard abortion as perfectly moral and acceptable, others find it difficult to distinguish and distinguish it morally from the taking of life of someone who has been born. Then we have to accept that the moral difficulty is not just in the act of the abortion, but also in the act of facilitating it, as has been mentioned. It seems to me that when we are clear that something is wrong, we are also clear that facilitating that thing, whatever it may be, is also wrong. We understand that if anyone who facilitates becomes complicit in the act in question and moral responsibility is thus engaged. In this context, my lords, these amendments simply don't make sense. If we were to accept the logic upon which they rest, we would have to expunge from our law any recognition that someone who helps to facilitate an illegal act has any kind of culpability. Culpability should only rest with the person who does the act. Mindful of these considerations, my Lord, it's very difficult to see these amendments as anything other than an attempt to weaken and undermine conscientious objection. If someone genuinely believes that an act is wrong, the provision of a legal assurance that they don't have to do the act, but only facilitate it, um, it makes uh, the profession in question no longer open to them than they had been required to actually do the act itself. Anyone in this situation with a sense of integrity, wholeness, requiring consistency across their uh, moral life would have to leave the profession in that context. My Lord, I had friends who, um, when they went up for a consultant post in obstetrics, they would be asked the question, are you prepared to take your share of abortions? If they said yes, they were considered for the appointment. If, on the other hand, they said yes, quite prepared to take uh, my share of the abortions within the act of 1967. They were not considered for the appointment and they had to emigrate. And I have many friends who had to do that. For, for the noble Lord McColl giving way. Uh, I think the House deserves clarity on that statement, uh, if, if he doesn't mind. I have a huge respect for the amazing work that Lord McCall has done in surgery over very many years. But I've been in obstetric and gynecological practice as a consultant for quite a long time, and I've been on many interview bodies looking at staff who would be working in obstetrics and gynecology. And I read, I, sadly, I was not here for the second reading, but I read his speech at second reading where he made that point very clearly. And I don't recognize that happening in the services in which I've worked. In fact, I think that that discrimination is exceptionally uncommon. And I'm very surprised that he says that he finds that a number of people have needed to go overseas. That seems to me to be rather an unusual situation. I, I, I just, I would really quite like some clarity on that because I think it is an important point because it does actually affect the amendments that I've put down later in, in, in the discussion in, in this bill. I thank the noble lord for his uh, intervention. I'm not saying it happens now. I'm saying what I found in my experience. They were, they were my friends. And I can give the noble lord their names and addresses because uh, they were extremely good obstetricians practicing in Australasia. 
uh, but I'm very happy to give uh, details uh, to him. Uh, it, it seems to me an important part of um, the British liberal constitutional tradition that we place a lot of emphasis on freedom. And this freedom has many aspects, but central to it is the opportunity to work in one's chosen profession without being required to act in a way that violates one's own identity. Ours is not a constitutional tradition in which we use the law to compel people to decide between acting against their deepest moral convictions and losing their livelihood. The hounding of people out of their jobs on this basis is deeply illiberal. My Lords, although our constitutional tradition is one that is closely associated with liberty, I have to say that there are moments in our history uh, when we have failed in this regard. I fear that historians looking back um, on this set of amendments a hundred years' time might recoil from what from them and, and, and wonder how on earth we came so close on stepping away from our historic British commitment to liberty. Now, my Lords, I am, of course, aware that beneath these amendments rests what some would purport to be a respectable argument. It goes, I think, something like this. Women, women have a right to have an abortion. People who conscientiously object effectively have the temerity to suggest that their rights as a service provider are more important than the rights of the service user. In this context, we need to rein in our conscientious objection so that it only applies to doing the act, not facilitating it. My Lords, this logic is deeply flawed for two reasons. Firstly, workers... Does the noble lord want to say something? No. First, workers have the rights and consumers have rights too. I'm most grateful to the noble lord for taking this intervention. But does he accept that the Dugan case, correctly decided, accurately states the law as it has been for the last 50 years under the 1967 Act, and that these amendments do no more and no less than state the position as it is now authoritatively decided by the Supreme Court in Dugan. Does my Lord accept that? Yes, I, I accept that entirely. But uh, we don't necessarily have to abide by that decision. If people feel strongly that um, it was the wrong decision, they have the right to come to Parliament and produce legislation and try and get it through that changes that. That is the right of Parliament. Parliament decides not the courts. The courts have to interpret what Parliament has said, mm. and sometimes Parliament rushes legislation through so quickly. There are loopholes and problems, and they need to be corrected later. But it's not the job of the court to produce the law. Um, it's the Secretary of State... Uh, Lord, for giving way. Could he perhaps just define what he means by facilitate? Um, we are referring to hands-on, that is the person who is actually going to do the abortion. But what does he mean by facilitate? The secretary who makes the appointment facilitates the abortion. Well, facilitate means a great number of different things. But... Um, the, the, the Act of 67 did provide... Oh, you must answer the question. If the secretary in a hospital or a clerk who was involved in this service had a conscientious objection to abortion, would that be facilitating? Would she see it, he or she see it as facilitating the abortion? Is that what you're referring to? Because it applies to everybody. Well, if she has a conscientious objection to it, it uh, then she shouldn't be obliged to do it because the Act of 67 specifically said that people didn't need to do it. And 
Acts of Parliament shouldn't force people into doing things against their conscience. That's not the function of Parliament. Very good point, and indeed it a case was referred to earlier in our committee proceedings concerning Janway. I think her name was Barbara Janway, and she was exactly what the noble baroness Lady Tong described, a medical secretary, and she said she would not, I think these were her words, put the ball in motion. And so, as a result of that, she lost her job, and the courts upheld that she should not be able to continue in that post. Now, the law in 1967, the debates in 1967 in the House of Commons didn't consider cases like that at the time, <coughs> because it wasn't envisaged that that might be a problem. And that surely is why the noble lord is right in saying that this ultimately, it, although the Supreme Court may rule in a particular way, and say that is what the law, where the law now stands. It is the job of this place, Parliament, to say, well, the law perhaps now needs to be changed. Or not. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. It was very helpful. Um, my Lord, somebody <coughs> did suggest that there weren't a great number of people with a conscientious objection. The NHS employs 1,200,000 people. Surely you can find enough people to do abortions who wouldn't be offended. Has anyone thought about that? No. Um, surely it's possible for the NHS with such a large workforce to... I'm, I'm grateful to the Noble Lord, but again, I, I would come back to the provisions uh, within Clause 2, um, because to say that there are people within the National Health Service, uh, uh, for quite a few months I was a porter at the old Westminster Hospital. Um, uh, and, um, but given that his argument, I, I, I believe, goes that there will be other people who could do it, for that to happen you need to delegate and pass it on. But according to Clause 2 uh, of the proposed Act, participating in any activity includes delegation or supporting of staff in respect of that activity. 1,200,000 employees in the NHS. Surely there are not people who can do the delegation uh, uh, so there wouldn't be a problem. I don't know. Perhaps, perhaps. My Lords, I haven't made myself clear. Um, there would be no duty uh, on the person who did not want to be engaged in the process to delegate it onwards to somebody else, according to the provisions of Clause 2. Exactly right, but I'm, I keep on saying there are so many people around, hordes of people, 1,200,000 people. Surely you can find somebody who can delegate it, and you keep pointing to the bill. But Surely there are a lot of people around in the clinic. Somebody can do the delegation and make the arrangement. My Lord. Um. Right in his interpretation of the bill, uh, it lays no duty on any other person to <laughs> carry out that delegation. The noble lord is correct that there would be other people working within the service who would doubtless carry on as they do now. Uh, one abortion takes place every three minutes in this country, 20 every hour, 600 every working day. There have been more than 8 million 200, since 1967, over 200,000 every year. So clearly there are no shortage of people who are willing to participate in those procedures. This bill is about those who are unwilling to participate in them. Well, uh, of course, at the moment there is a duty to refer that duty to refer would be overruled by Clause 2 of the Act. Delegation and referral are not the same thing, and that the, what is provided in here is, is a, a right to conscientiously object to, to delegation. I beg your pardon, Lord Macaulay, I shouldn't have interrupted you. To be interrupted. This is what I think a debate is about, toing and froing. I don't think they're not toing and froing. Anyway, uh, if we use the law to impose uh, an approach that is intolerant of conscience and forces some people uh, out of the, of the medical profession and effectively dissuades others from joining the profession, and that's an important point, many people will, will suffer as a result. 
We're already uh, short of uh, recruiting new doctors. We, um, we really, these amendments are the last thing that we need. Um, the medical profession, uh, in the medical profession, we um, have the greater um, overall capacity, and the greater our overall capacity, the greater the capacity to, to provide abortion, as we've been trying to say. Um, plenty of people without conscientious objections. The suggestion that um, has been made that we should adopt these amendments because they reflect what Lady Hale has suggested in the Dougal judgment, um, I think we've, been, we've mentioned that, first of all, uh, we don't have to be constrained by her judgment. We are at liberty to come back and change the law if it's the will of Parliament. And that point we've made. And uh, looking secondly at what Lady Hale actually said in her judgment, she did um, recognise that there are two potential ways of interpreting the intention of Parliament with respect to conscientious objection. A broad way and a narrow way. The broad meaning might cover things done in connection with that treatment after it had begun, such as assigning staff to work with a patient supervising and supporting such staff and keeping a managerial eye on all the patients in the ward, including any undergoing a termination. A narrow meaning uh, would restrict it to actually taking part. That is actually performing the tasks involved in the course of treatment. She concluded that it is the narrow meaning that is more likely to have been in the contemplation of Parliament when the Act yeah. was passed. What we are trying to do is change the law so it makes it quite clear that isn't so, and we have every right so to do. I believe this bill is timely and uh, a liberal measure which should get the support that it needs. These amendments, by contrast, are deeply mistaken for three reasons. Firstly. It will hurt the service providers by imposing an ugly uniformity that will result in many more Mary Dugan cases losing their job. And by the way, I would like to ask an overlord um, um, who, whose bill it was uh, in, in 1967. Um, yeah, Lord, I'm sorry, never Lord Steele. Uh, does he agree? that the decision in Glasgow to sack Mary Dugan because of her conscientious objection to be involved in abortion, does he believe that was the right decision? She was a wonderful midwife. Mid midwife. She'd done <coughs> over 5,000 abortions, and over uh, 5,000 deliveries, and um, was a very valuable member of the team. Does he think um, that was the right decision?